Welcome to the Joe Watt Podcast. I am Joe Vendermini from the University of Florida Rand Cattle Research and Education Center. And today our guest is Mr. David McCollum. David, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Joe. Um, David, can you please give us some background information about you? I'm a uh, fourth generation cattleman from Florida. I uh, was raised on a Hereford ranch in North Florida and uh, been been a part of the cattle industry most all of my life. Uh, that's that's kind of where my, my roots lie and they still do today. And, and David, uh, here at the Crooked Lake Ranch, uh, you have a, a Hereford program here. And could you please give us some background information about the, how that evolved and uh, the program that you have here? Yes. Uh, Mr. Wilson, Pat Wilson from uh, Frostproof here, had this ranch he bought back in the 50s, and we, he had a passion for Hereford cattle, and he started breeding Hereford cattle in the early uh, mid 50s, and we've been uh, trying to produce a, a Florida-raised type Hereford here. He brought me in 32 years ago, and we, we've uh, tried to continue that legacy. He's uh, not with us anymore, but we're still working on on producing Hereford cattle that can survive the Florida heat and humidity. And, and David, um, we have seen the history of Hereford that was extremely popular, if not the most popular breed many years ago. And then it seems that like the producer lost a little interest in the Hereford. And, and can you please tell us how that play off on your business and, and what is the situation of the Hereford right now, the, the way that you see? Well, we, we've gotten out marketed pretty hard by the Angus Association with, with their uh, certified beef program. Uh, so we've taken a, a very back seat that uh, we weren't accustomed to setting in during that period of time. But, but uh, we're trying as association to bring these cattle back into alignment to, to compete on the uh, carcass merits uh, as long as with the other merits that the Hereford cattle bring to the, to the table. And uh, we're trying very hard to be successfully and compete with them on a, on a level playing field. And, and David, what do you think is one of the characteristics of the, the Hereford that you think really can help us in, in the cattle business that will make somebody to really think about Hereford in the crossbreeding program? Well, I really believe that the Hereford with the heterosis and the hybrid vigor that, that the Hereford cattle has had for many, many decades that uh, that has now been washed away from the kit from the uh, base mama cow in the, in the nation uh, that they that you could use the Hereford genetics to to, uh, to spike your hyper vigor and to get you some heterosis back in some cattle that might be losing heterosis because black hair on black hair you continue to wash that down to where it's it's not going to give you the spike that you're 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 accustomed to having with the cross breeding program and the fact that we have docile cattle. For the most part, our cattle are very docile. Would help with the uh, handling of the cattle and stress of the cattle, so we can we can uh, fix some of the problems that uh, that are presented to the cow people on on a uh, on a day in and day out basis. And can you give us just a brief explanation? Because we, when you go to the Hereford, we we see the Old Hereford and the Horned Hereford. So, and they are probably from the same pool, but do you see a lot of difference between both? Uh, you know, years ago when the poles were chasing the show ring harder than the horn, uh, the horn cattle were a little uh, superior. Uh, but since then, we have kind of caught up to the, to, the, uh, to the same area. We've gotten the hip and the muscle that the horn cattle got. So the pole cattle are kind of, and the horn cattle are kind of interchangeable anymore. But but uh, it's still hard to get the marketplace back for the pole cattle because of that that uh, framey, non-meaty type pole cattle that that roamed around back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So you you believe probably the selection for the pole would have take away a little bit of the production side of the the animal by the time that they made the selection way back. Yes, there was definitely some genetics that was inferior that that got a bad taste in a lot of producers' mouths. So we've had to to correct, try to correct that problem. It's very hard to go back and and uh, fix an area that that damaged your marketplace. But uh, I feel like that we've gotten a lot accomplished in the past uh, thirty years 
and getting that uh, animal more quality uh, to compete on, on the uh, same level as the horn genetics. And, and David, for sure, the, the Hereford that we have nowadays is very different from the old Hereford that were like 40 years ago. We have made tremendous progress in selection. And we know here for the Southeast that when we make a composite, actually they became quite popular, right? And you can name any composite, but the one that comes to my mind is the Brayford, right? That is a cross between the Hereford and the Brahman. Um, and we have a very tight population of Braefords. I, I'm just wondering, and I talk to other producers regarding other breeds, the same, the same question. Do you think that probably will be time to get this good Hereford that we have and get a better Brahma that we have right now and try to create a composite like a, a Braeford that will be like a new one that will have better genetics? Oh, absolutely. I think any time that you cross the, the current genetics that we're working with, with the selection and the pressure that the breeders today put on them, and the, the knowledge of the nutrition that goes in and out of these cattle are, are, are highly monitorable, and that we can have these inheritable genetics push forward that you could surpass anything that was done back in the day by just simply selection and pressure of the new genetics that we have today. And, and I, I think uh, the, if you have this new composite, it can actually be beneficial for the population that we have, right? From the Brayford, we have a new Brayford and you cross with the, the foundation Brayford that we have. We may get an etherosis or something, right? Oh, absolutely. I, I would see that that would be a win-win for the Brayford breeders of, of, of this area as well as uh, throughout the southeast region. Uh, to, to incorporate new genetics is always a good plus because you get a chance to monitor and, and, and measure the performance at the particular level that you marketplace is requiring you to measure at. And uh, you get a chance to, to, to spike that and to get a, 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 an animal that would be able to reproduce itself mm -hmm. and not be you know, across the board uh, ups and downs where you end up variation in your cattle. You get more uniform setting of cattle with the, the genetics we're playing with now that we're continuing to wind up that are performing well at, 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 uh, at different ranches in the South. And, and David, um, can you please tell us what is the emphasis of your breeding and selection, a selection program here at the... Well, I'm in a very unique situation. We don't we don't have a female sale, so we don't sell our females. We use in-house females for our own improvements, and I put a lot of pressure on uh, the fertility side. My females, my my heifers, whether they're commercial or Angus or or Hereford, the, they're all 42 day breeding season, and after sonogram pregnancy, those animals are exposed again for uh, another 30 days. And then I sell those as spring calvers. So my genetics are only exposed for 42 days for my replacement females. And I've been doing that for over a decade. So what happened there going forward in my cow herd, I've, I only allow them 52 days of, of exposure. And therefore I end up with a uniform set of calves. My calves average coming within the 47 day window of, of calving season. So therefore my marketing I'm able to market these calves as equals and not looking at 90 day apart in age. I'm looking at 47 days. And it's a lot easier from a judging standpoint or a marketing standpoint to look at those uh, those calves that are tightly aged versus strung out and try to predict where they're going to end at. And you do sell bulls here. A absolutely. We have a bull market that we try to sell. A lot of my bulls. Uh, has gone out west to, to the Nebraska, South Dakota to go on black cattle because they've been uh, marketing well and performing well. We, we created moderate big rib cattle here uh, for this Bahia grass. And when it gets out to that uh, western Nebraska and South Dakota, those cattle transition very well into that country and create a very marketable product for, the, for my, my uh, customers out there. But I do sell local. And I do have a composite uh, that I've sell also. 
And and can you tell us a little bit about the composite? And I, I found a like-minded breeder in the Angus Association that breeds for grass performance. Mm -hmm. and it has big ribs and, and has a, a moderate frame. And we crossed those two with the uh, Hereford cow here in Florida. And uh, we, we've got now a F1 program, which I have a market for that uh, people are using the females because of the fertility that's in those cattle. As well as the steers are are doing performing very well in the feedlot. And uh, on your program, do you bring some outside genetics as well, or you are a closed program and you just use your genetics? I, I'm only using my genetics. I only want to test what works on this little sand hill here in Frostburg. Mm -hmm. uh, I have tried outside genetics, and they've always come back with a problem, and I've had to eliminate them fairly fast. So I put a lot of pressure on. We don't have eye problem, we don't have foot problem, and we don't have reproduction problems. You know, they have to lay down, spit out a cash, and get bred back in a, in a very tight window. Uh, we don't allow for, for a lot of missteps along the way. So outside genetics have a tendency to drag me in the wrong direction. So I've, I've, I've eliminated all the outside genetics and just use in-house. And, and David, we are going towards the end of our conversation here. And uh, when you are not working here in the ranch, can you tell us what are your hobbies or the things that you do on the side? Uh, you'll find me uh, chasing redfish and trout in the panhandle of Florida. I was raised right outside of Gainesville, and I have a very uh, fond memory of my youth fishing around the Gulf Coast at the Big Bend area. Okay. And, and David, I would like to thank you for participating in the podcast today. And I'm Joe Vendramini. Joe what? <laughs>